Oh, Brandon Young Kemke's. Um, on Mythbusters, they say, uh, you seem to take particular pleasure in the construction and execution of small-scale experiments. What was the best part of small-scale experiments? Well, let's talk about Mythbusters structure. The beginning of every Mythbusters episode, the first experiment that anyone's gonna do is going to be akin to what would two idiots with a Sunday to themselves in a garage full of tools do? That's the first test. It's always the lowest threshold to entry, the, 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 the bored high school teenager threshold of like, all right, let's just start tossing toast off the table and see if it lands buttered side down. Um, then there's some research, there's some methodological uh, uh, building of an experiment. Hold on. And then there are small scale experiments and then following the small scale experiment, there's some giant experiment, which is spectacular and also probably dumb in some very funny way. Um, given that structure, simple experiment, small scale experiment, large scale experiment, um, all the science in the show happens in the small scale experiment. The large one is usually a confirmation of the small scale. So, the real methodological testing happens in the middle of the episode. That's why I loved the small scale experiments. They were usually, the very first time I had a, a, a rig I needed to build that I had not built before and I couldn't find plans for one was the uh, wind tunnel that showed how a penny has two terminal velocities. This was for, will a penny thrown from the Empire State Building kill you when it hits the ground? And I won't tell you that whole story right now because I've told it many times, but the simple act for me of hypothesizing that if I wanted to show two terminal velocities of a penny, I should probably have a wind tunnel that had an X, uh, a maximum and a minimum that were above both of those values, so that if I got them right and I put a penny in this wind tunnel, it would tumble up and down. That was the theory, that was the hypothesis. And when I built the rig and I put the penny in and it did go up and down and it matched my hypothesis, holy hell, I, can, I can't tell you how deeply abiding and moving that endorphin was, endorphin rush was for me. Um, and it never left. Every time after that, I have ever built a method a methodology for testing something and tested it, whether my hypothesis was correct or not, just getting an answer to a question is deeply moving, especially when you've applied some rigor to it and you feel like you could stand behind the answer. Um, so in every way, the small and medium scale experiments were like, I could wrap my whole arms around them. My favorite small scale experiments, blasting caps. We did some stuff about tenderizing vegetables with explosives late in the game. And so we had like <coughs> shrink wrapped tomatoes underwater and we were detonating blasting caps near them. And I, the, the slow-mo guys and I have talked a lot about how, how absolutely delightful tiny explosions in water are for the high-speed camera. Cause you get to watch cavitation and collapse and shock waves, so much is played out for you. And it's so luscious and like beautiful in this tank. Oh God, I really loved the water tank stuff. That was deeply moving. Uh, Brian Baker wants to know, we got to see the finished product on screen, but how many people were actually involved in planning a myth? Um, how many people were involved in the planning of a myth? Um, it varied greatly, but in general, the Mythbusters production team was about 22 to 25 people strong, including the five hosts. Um, we had between four and seven producers and one supervising producer and then one executive producer. So the executive producer, uh, Jamie and I were co-executive producers with Dan Tapster. Um, and then below us was the supervising producer, which for the longest time was Alice Dallow, and then was uh, Steve Christensen, Steve-O. Um, and then the, 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 the on-the-ground producers, uh, Linda Wolkovich, Dennis Kwan, Jax Marker, uh, Claire Mandel, Caroline Odson, 
uh, who else, who else? I'm forgetting some, I'm sure. Alice Dallow, obviously. Uh, 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 oh my God, Coco. It's like, there's so many. They were so mission critical, each of those producers, because uh, each myth was given to one of the associate producers the, 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 to manage. Um, and each one of those four to seven producers was managing probably between one and three stories at any given time. There's like one that was shooting, one that was planning, one that was like in the, in the early planning stages. Um, but giving those producers autonomy to produce those stories and work with Jamie and I or the other team on those stories was really great because they took responsibility for <clears throat> all the permitting, and all the location management. And location management turned out to be a really critical thing for our team um, because uh, we spent a lot of time on location. And when you leave the door with a camera crew, you might not realize this. It's super expensive for real. It's, it's stupid expensive to film on the street in any kind of normal way. So if you're like a, a commercial team and you're taking a cameraman and a soundo and a couple of crew members out onto the street with permits, honestly, it very quickly ends up being thousands of dollars a day to film. Um, and those costs add up. And uh, it also can take real time to permit a space. But when you have producers that have excellent relationships with each location they've ever filmed at, because we always left them better than we found them, that meant that we could turn on a dime. Um, and that was really specifically in the laps of the producers to manage those client, those, those location relationships. Um, but on average, yeah, it was, a, it was a, a team, like I said, between 20 and 25 people. Phil Carter says, what was the best filming location? Alameda Runway. Alameda Runway. Over across the bay is Alameda Island, a beautiful little little jewel in the San Francisco Bay. And on the north side of Alameda Island in the main shipping lane for Oakland, California, where the container ships drop their stuff, um, there is a, a, a runway. It's a mile and a half long. And it's where they shot all the driving stunts from the second Matrix film. Um, and it is one of the most beautiful places to stand in the Bay Area. Full stop. San Francisco, one of the most beautiful cities in the world, sits there like Oz in the distance. When the sun is setting, it can be transcended. Um, thank you guys so much for watching. And I wanted to briefly mention that you could become a tested member. I know everybody is competing for you to become a member of their thing. What I want to express to you is that the tested membership has become such an important part of the tested family. We get tremendous feedback from the tested members and they expand the stories that we can tell and the things that we have access to. And you can become a part of it right now by clicking on the link below. See you in the chat.